Hi everybody, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist. We're going to continue with Aaron's letter, shall we? Um, we're up to the point where she brings in the name of Jehovah, for where there are two or three gathered together in the name of Jehovah. I said it wouldn't matter if it, there was one, that the Lord is still there in the midst of them. And even as Jesus returned to heaven, his disciples wrote in 1 Corinthians 5.14, When you are gathered together in the name of our Lord Jesus, and knowing that I am with you in spirit. We went into the study on the spirit, along with the power of our Lord Jesus. We have a spirit. That's all I'm going to say at this point. If you want to know more about it, look at the last study. But we do have a spirit. There's no two ways about it. Um, when we are gathered at our meetings at the Kingdom Hall, we are there being taught by Jehovah. We are gathered in the name of Jehovah. And while we are there, we are being taught different good news to what Paul taught. Do you see how my mind is troubled? When mum was there, whoop, what's happened there? When mum was here, she mentioned about that name of Jehovah and was to be made known or magnified to entire inhabited earth. When you type magnified into the search of the JW app, this is what comes up. Psalm 35, 27. But let those who take pleasure in my righteousness shout joyfully. May they constantly say, May Jehovah be magnified, who takes pleasure in the peace of his servant. Psalm, 90, Psalm 40, 16. But let those seeking you exalt and rejoice in you. May those who love your acts of salvation always say, May Jehovah be magnified what was his act of salvation the finished work of the lord jesus christ psalm 70 verse 4 let those who are seeking you exult and rejoice in you may those who love your acts of salvation what was the act of salvation the finished work of the lord jesus christ when he was crucified always say may god be magnified now the acts of salvation are the good news of the lord jesus christ which aaron mentioned earlier Psalm 138 verse 2, I will bow down towards your holy temple and I will praise your name because of your loyal love and your faithfulness. For you have magnified your saying and your name above everything else. Now when did um, was his loyal love and his faithfulness displayed? When Jesus was crucified. It's in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Malachi 1.5, your own eyes will see it and you will say, May Jehovah be magnified over the territory of Israel. This goes to show how central Israel to the whole um, New and Old Testament. Acts 19.17, this became known to all, both Jews and the Greeks who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus went, the name of the Lord Jesus went on being magnified. Wow. Um, Philippians 1.20 This is in harmony with my eager expectation. just want to go back there. Just see how now it switched to the fact that it was the name of the Lord Jesus' name that went being magnified. Philippians 1.20 This is in harmony with my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed in any respect, but that with all freeness of speech, Christ will now, as always before, be magnified by means of my body, whether through life or through death. Before Jesus' time, the Bible speaks of Jehovah being magnified. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, it was the name of Jesus that was being preached by the first century Christians. Jesus' name was being made known and magnified. What a fantastic point. Wow, that's a pretty powerful theological point there made by Aaron. When Jesus himself said at Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the most distant part of the earth. So why, when I go door to door, am I talking about the name of Jehovah, not the name of Jesus? Like even Jesus said, I should. Do you see how I'm concerned? I can see how you're concerned. In fact, when I type Jesus as Lord and Jesus is Lord in the JW app, my mind is blown at the context 
of all the Greek scriptures. I wonder how Erin come to the point where she realised that Jesus was the central, um, the centrality of the whole thing, because she see, received a powerful revelation, hasn't she? Their message was for people to have faith in the good news of Jesus having died and being resurrected on the third day. Romans 10, 9 and 10. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and that there is Jesus is Jehovah, and exercise faith in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one exercises faith for righteousness, but with the mouth one makes public declaration for salvation. I notice it doesn't say if you publicly declare of your mouth that Jehovah is Lord. No, it's actually that Jesus is Jehovah and exercise faith in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one exercises faith for righteousness, but with the mouth one makes public declaration to salvation. I've been struggling with the fact that the name of Jehovah has been inserted 230 times in our New World Translation where the word Lord not all capitals, and sometimes not even Lord, but the word God is, I can understand in the original Hebrew scripture putting it back where Lord, all capitals, appears, but adding it where it's not capitals worries me. It worries me because it changes the context of the scripture. Wow! I'll show you examples. Example A is the scripture where Jehovah was added. B is a contrasting scripture where Jehovah could not be inserted because Jesus was there. And not just the word Lord. Now here we go. Example A, Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as surely as I live, says Jehovah, Lord only, capital L, in the kingdom interlinea and King James. To me every knee will bend and every tongue will open acknowledgement to God. The whole contents of Romans 14 is that Paul is telling the Christians not to judge each other. That they each would stand before the throne of God for how they lived their lives, specifically verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, for if we live, we live to Jehovah, and if we die, we die to Jehovah. So both if we live and if we die, we belong to Jehovah, Lord. For to the end, Christ died and came to life again, so that he might be Lord over both the living and the dead. You see, that's where the, that's where the Jehovah Witnesses thing doesn't work, does it? Because it's putting Jehovah left, right and centre, but it's going to crisscross with Jesus being Jehovah, isn't it? But they won't admit that. Read verse 8 using the name Jehovah where it's inserted. Then read it again using the word Lord, like it is in the Kingdom Interlunia and King James Bible. And you will see how verse 9 makes sense. That the original writers were talking about... Je this, is, this is a highly theological paper. This is a <laughs> this is a really good paper. This is a um, this is a I'd rate this as a very well written theological paper. There you go, Aaron. Because it's grinding out the nonsense and getting back to Jesus, which is what true theology is all about. Makes sense. The original writers were talking about Jesus and that. It would be in the name of Jesus every knee would bend and whether if and that whether if we live or die he'll be Lord. That's right. <clears throat> Example B, Philippians two, nine through ten. For this re very reason God exalted him to be a superior position. Hang on. God resulted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every name. So then in the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground. Now, now, see that, those under the ground, this is something that the Jehovah Witnesses miss. What's it talking about that peep knees will bend to those that are under the ground? Hmm, yeah, guess what? Somewhere down there is a place called Sheol and the souls of the, the, the wicked dead are there. They're not in the mind of God, they're in Sheol. Example 2. A, Romans 10, 9 through 15. For if we publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and, and what Lord? Jehovah. And exercise faith in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one exercises faith for righteousness, but with the mouth one makes public declaration for salvation. For the scripture says, No one who rests his faith on him will be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. There is the same Lord over all, who is rich toward those calling on him. For everyone who calls on the name of... Wow! That's referring to Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah, there, yeah. See, this, I, I just want to say to Aaron, I applaud the way you've done this because this is, this is how theology works. She's cutting through all the nonsense. I just want to bring myself up here. She's cutting through all the nonsense and she's getting to the, um, the crux of it, which is Jesus. She's cutting through the deception and the lies and she's getting to the bottom of it, which is about Jesus. I, I tell you, this is a really good... This isn't turning into just a letter. This is turning an, into a theological um, exposition. In the Kingdom Linear Bible and also the King James Version, it is rendered Lord, not capitals. That takes a lot of effort to get to the bottom of this stuff. Um, we'll be saved. However... How will they call on the name, on him, if they have not put faith in him? How in turn will they put faith in him about whom they have not heard? How in turn will they hear it without someone to preach? How in turn will they preach unless they have been sent out? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who declare good news, the good news of good things. The con excuse me, hang on, the context of those verses is that people needed to know about Jesus so they could call on him, exactly, personally call on him, so they could have salvation and a happy life and peace with God. Remember the good news I talked about above? I do exactly. I asked myself, why would the translators of the New World Translation insert the name of Jehovah and mess with the context of the inspired words of God. This bothers me, my conscience. Now, the thing about the New World Translation is, nobody's put their name on it. Not one person. And um, that's a warning sign. That's not a thing that they've done to be humble. That's a thing that they've done so nobody can be accountable. Okay? It's just, it's just a, such a terrible translation. Now, I can't see without my glasses. Hang on. V, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. I'm, I'm imagining that would be 1 Corinthians. To the congregation of God that is in Corinth, to you who have been sanctified in union with Christ Jesus, called to be holy ones. Now, that's not speaking to an elite group. That's speaking to all the people that were in that congregation. Okay? together with all those everywhere who are calling on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. You can't take the Lord away from, ship away from Christ, can you? Example 3. A. Revelation 2, 22, 6 through 7. He said to me, These words are faithful, true, yes, Jehovah, Lord in the kingdom into Lania and King James Bible. The God who inspired the prophets has sent his angel to show his slaves the things that must shortly take place. Look, I'm coming quickly. Happy is anyone observing the words of the prophecy of this scroll. Now, the word Lord in the Greek scriptures is always referring to Jesus. John confirms this by saying, replying, Come, Lord Jesus, in the verse quoted below. In Revelation 22:20, 20, The one who bears witness of these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's true. It's correct. Jesus himself tells us to come to him. Matthew 11:28 Come to me all you who are toiling and loaded down and I will refresh you. Mark 10:14 At seeing this Jesus was in the Wow, hang on, I need to take a break. Wow. This this letter's loaded. Mark 10:14 At seeing this Jesus was indignant and said to them, Let the young children come to me. Do not try to stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such ones. Now it's an interesting verse because in many ways that's what the watchtower is doing, isn't it? He's they're balking people 
from coming to Jesus. But Aaron's seeing through that and she's trying to help these other Jehovah Witnesses see through this. But I'm starting to realize how thick the deception is. I didn't realize. Luke 6, 47, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Now what's doing them? It's loving your neighbor as yourself. Luke fourteen twenty six. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now you've got to be careful of that verse because that verse could be used for shunning, couldn't it? If you're not following me, um, if you're putting family and everything first, you're not following me. But that's not that's not true. That's just not true. You can't neglect your family for this religious stuff. Luke eighteen sixteen. not even for Jesus. However, Jesus called the infants to him, saying, Let the young children come to me, and do not try to stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. John five forty. And yet you do not want to come to me, so that you may have life? Wow. Aaron, this is brilliant, honestly. John six thirty five through thirty thirty seven. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, whoever comes to me will not get hungry at all, and whoever exercises faith in me will never get thirsty at all. All those whom the Father gives me will come to me, and I will never drive away the one who comes to me. John six forty four through 45 No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will resurrect him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They will all be taught by Jehovah. Now the name of Jehovah is added here, but the kingdom in the land in King James reads, taught of God. It doesn't even have the word Lord. Everyone who has listened to the Father and has learned comes to me. What, an, what a letter. Goodness gracious. Wow. John 6.65, he went on to say, This is why I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. That's Jehovah, isn't it? On the last day, the great day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he called out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Jesus gave his followers strong warning to pay attention that they not be led away to someone else. Even though they had said to Jesus at John 6, 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, whom shall we go? Or where shall we go? Or whom shall we go to? You have sayings of everlasting life. They had full confidence that they remain a follower of Jesus. I asked myself, was Jesus confident they wouldn't be misled? Was Jesus' words to his people? Jesus knew we'd fail. That's okay. Matthew 24, 4-5, in answer, Jesus said to them, Look out that nobody misleads you, for many will come on the basis of my name, <laughs> saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Matthew 24, 11, many false prophets will rise and mislead many. Matthew twenty four twenty four. The false Christ and the false prophets will arise and will perform great signs and wonders so as to mislead. Mark thirteen five through six. So Jesus began to tell them, Look out that nobody misleads you. Many will come on the basis of my name, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. And then Mark thirteen twenty two through twenty three, for false Christ and false prophets will arise, and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the chosen ones, even the chosen ones. You then watch out. I have told you all things beforehand. And that's exactly what Aaron's doing here. She's watching out, isn't she? Luke twenty one eighteen. he said, Look out that you are not misled, for many will come on the basis of my name, saying, I am he, and the, and the due time is near. Do not go after them. There was an important event that happened at the moment of Jesus' death that I read at Matthew twenty seven fifty one, And look, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. Inside on the scriptures says this about the most holy that the curtains, the curtain blocked. Symbolic use, the most holy compartment in the tent of meeting or the tabernacle contained the Ark of the Covenant. The cover of the Ark surmounted by two golden cherubs represented God's throne. Therefore the most holy was used figuratively to represent the dwelling place of Jehovah God, heaven itself. The inspired letter to the Hebrews, which is exactly what come to mind, gives us this interpretation of matters when it compares the entry of Israel's high priest into the most holy once day a year 
on the Day of Atonement with the entry of the Great High Priest, Jesus Christ, into the Most Holy symbolized, once and for time, once for all, for time, with his sacrifice for sins, it was done once and for all. It explains into the second compartment, the Most Holy, the High Priest alone enters once a year without blood, which he offers for himself and for sins of all the ignorance of the people. This very tent is an illustration for the appointed time that is now here. However, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that will have come to pass, through the, through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered not, he entered, no, not with the blood of goats and of young bulls, but with his own blood, once for all time into the holy place and obtained an everlasting deliverance for us all, not just 144,000. Therefore, it was necessary that the typical representations of the things in the heavens should be cleansed by these men, by, should be cleansed by these means, blood of animal sacrifices splinkered on them, but the heavenly things themselves with sacrifices that are better than such sacrifices, for Christ entered not into a holy place made with hands, which is a copy of the reality, but into heaven itself now to appear before the person of God for us. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness for the way of entry into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, what a beautiful passage. We have boldness, don't we? In other words, do you believe that the finished work of Jesus is enough? Because everything that Aaron's fighting for in this letter is saying that. She's actually proving that she had the boldness to believe that when Jesus entered that place with his blood, it was enough for her and everybody else to have peace with God for time and eternity, which he opened up for us as a new and living way through the curtain, that is, his flesh. See, he opened his flesh. He spilled his blood for us. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with sincere hearts and complete faith, having had our hearts sprinkled clean from a wicked conscience and our bodies bathed with clean water. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go to a scripture passage. Um, let me get it up. I'm pretty sure it's in Acts 20. Um, bear with me. This is how you study. I know it's in the back of my mind. Acts 20 and verse 28. Whose blood was Jesus' blood? Acts 20 and verse 28. Whose blood? was Jesus' blood. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Whose blood did God use to purchase everybody that he saved? His own blood. Whose blood was Jesus's? It was God's blood. Everything that Aaron's saying in this letter is so profound, it's so theologically profound and well, well written that I don't know how to applaud her. It's like I need to send her, her, this woman a certificate saying on this letter. In fact, I might even do that. This woman, I might send Aaron a letter just signed by myself commending her on the theological effort of, of what she's done to centralise Jesus through the maze and the fog of all the deception that's been thrown at her. I'm just going to say this again. Whose blood was spilled at the cross? It was God's blood. Look, it was, it was to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. It was his blood. Jesus' blood was God's blood. Now, where's that letter? Um... Where's Aaron's letter gone? Here it is here. So, wow, I must say I'm pretty well gobsmacked. Um, I just want to read Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 from the New World Translation one more time. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness for the way of entry into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, whose blood was Jesus' blood? We just read it, didn't we? Let's do it again. Acts 20, verse 28. Um to the shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. God's blood was Jesus' blood. Now, let me get Aaron's letter back. I'm a little bit... Yeah, here it is here. So, on that note, I need to finish. I have to say, um, goodness gracious, Aaron, I, I, I think you deserve some kind of um, 
commendation. This, the way you've done this letter, um, without, with minimal, you, you've used the scriptures in such a way as to push away the fog and create a way for, say, a person steering a ship in a fog could see clearly. You couldn't doubt that Jesus is the central focus of the Bible. Now, I don't know. These people, if they've read this letter, I don't know where they... they I think they probably would have put it down at this point because by the sound of it, Jehovah Witnesses are so horribly deceived that I don't think they could comprehend what you're actually saying here. I'm grasping it pretty easily because I'm used to this. I've listened and studied Hebrews well over a thousand times. Um, it's easy for me to grasp. But if this isn't a seed, if they've read this letter, this is probably about as good as a seed that anybody's ever going to sow. So I commend you, Aaron. Um, I look a bit tired, don't I? It's been a big day today, hauling around the Hawkesbury River and fixing cars and whatever else. Um, I wanted to make this effort today for Aaron and you guys that are following this, but please give me some comments. Um, it's obvious that Aaron just hasn't sat down and penned um, any kind of letter. She's written a theological paper that, as far as I'm concerned so far, stands up to any theological letter that I've, I've, I've read. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this could be turned into a manual to help people that really want to sit down and listen to what the Scriptures says. So this is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia, saying bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment if you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one of life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.